Hi friends, welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Today I'm delighted and honored to have Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms in Virginia here with us. Joel Salatin is a voice and a name that scarcely needs an introduction. He has been a voice of inspiration to very many. Joel, thank you for being here and for sharing your wisdom and your inspiration as widely as you have over the years. One of the questions that I was asked to ask you is one of your strengths is that you're very articulate and able to describe your ideas and positions well to other people. How can other farmers learn that skill? Generally, if a farmer is filling out a job description, nowhere on that job description will it say storytelling ability or communication skills. You know, it'll be things like managing animals or uh, keeping good records, you know, being able to repair things. <laughs> seldom, seldom do you see uh, communication on there. And so, you know, I've been blessed when I was uh, through school, you know, competing in forensics and debate, theater, drama. I was always in the school plays and especially the debate team and and learning to communicate and speak. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, I have a gift for that, uh, but it's a gift that's been honed. And I think this is what's important is that uh, you may not become the most gifted orator, but you can develop at least some rudimentary skills, whether you take a a couple of writing courses or join the local um, theater group. Uh, There's the international speakers nonprofit called Toastmasters, and their whole deal is um, there are local chapters all over the country, Toastmasters, and what they do is um, they teach communication and speaking skills, and you do little short vignettes, different kinds of little talks people critique you and you you know you work at it the truth is that people who learn to communicate in any field become the the pace setters kind of the you know the leaders in that field you don't have to be the best but if you can if you can tell the story the best you'll be considered an expert you'll be you know you'll you'll have it you'll have an audience People don't know. You know I, I I practice speeches in front of a mirror. You know, I I give them to myself in the mirror, and you, you practice your timing and you practice your words, and 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 then and then I read a lot. Uh, you know, farmers tend to not be readers, and uh, I would encourage just immersing yourself in a broad range of things. You know, keep up on current events. Read the old philosophy. Read, you know, everything from from. Um, Malabar Farm and, and Lewis Promfield, uh, Ed Faulkner and Plowman's Folly and Wendell Berry and, and, and immerse yourself in the language of, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging people to read you know, Norman Borlaug literature, but uh, uh, know, who, know who the players are and people who, people who know stuff, history, current events, signs of the times, trends, People who know stuff are make interesting conversationalists. I'm a voracious reader, an eclectic reader. I read everything from business to philosophy to religion to whatever marketing, self help, whatever, and I read things that I don't agree with uh, because you need to understand what other what other people are thinking. Uh, get in their heads so you know better how to articulate. These are all things that you can do to cultivate your own awareness and interestingness. And as you cultivate that, you'll you'll become someone people enjoy conversing with and listening to, simply because you'll uh, be able to have a better grasp of the subject matter. I seem to recall somewhere in one of your books you wrote that I think the topic was on organic certification in general. You wrote that rather than certifying the process that a farm uses, perhaps we should begin certifying their bookshelf. <laughs> Yes, I've said that more times than once. Unfortunately, organics, government organic certification at least, has become a, a bit of a, you know, a little checklist of do's and don'ts. You know, we understand that it's more than just a list of do's and don'ts. It's, a, it's an embrace of a, 
of a worldview, of a of a way we view life and the way the world works. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about you know, basic ecological function. You know, the the deep soils on the planet were not built with 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer. Uh, they they were built with carbon, solar, you know, real time solar energy converted to carbon and vegetation that rots or is eaten and manured in place. Uh, you know, these are the great principles, and it's a mindset, it's a worldview. And, uh, yeah, I have said numerous times what we ought to be looking for is, you know, what's on the magazine rack behind the toilet and what's on the bookshelf. That actually indicates where a person's mind is because where, you know, where your mind, where your mental treasure is, you know, that's where your heart will be. You mentioned that you read books that you don't agree with. And something I've been thinking about recently, there's this quote from – not Warren Buffett, but his business partner, uh, Charlie Munger. I'm par- paraphrasing a bit, but essentially he's saying you're not qualified to have an opinion until you can articulate the opposing viewpoint better than the opposition. I think if we followed that perspective, there would be a lot fewer opinions in the world, most likely. <laughs> yes, that's true. And, you know, on that point, if I may if swerve just a bit to this, this is one reason why... I don't picket McDonald's or write nasty letters about making GMOs illegal or closing down Monsanto or any of these other efforts because I, unlike many of the folk, my friends in this ecology movement, I think that the people who disagree with us are not evil intended. I think they are misguided. I think they're ignorant. And I I think they're wrong, but to denigrate the folks who who work at Monsanto as evil intended is a very different situation. I mean, my my neighbor here in Swope, physical physical neighbor, is the Mid-Atlantic sales rep for Monsanto. We couldn't be more divergent in how we view the way food and farming and ecology function, you know, in in the living dynamics of the soil and plant community. But he really believes, he's a good person, uh, he really believes that he is feeding the world, saving the, saving the planet from whatever, stupidity and starvation and famine, and you have to honor that. As soon as you assume that these big bad corporations are and and the people who run them the people who make glyphosate or whatever that they are ogres and evil intended and you conceive of them in your mind as some sort of a, a devil or a demon you suddenly a shut yourself off from ever making a bridge with them and number two you actually hurt your own ability to step into the marketplace of ideas with something that's helpful because it prejudices your mind and your thinking. Now, you've now prejudged them in their intent. Now, we can talk about effect all day, and that's, that's what I do, but I never assume that even people I disagree with vehemently in, in politics, for example, I always assume that they're good intended, and, and I thank debate for this because – in, in high school and college, uh, interscholastic and intercollegiate debate, uh, I have a room full of trophies on this. You know, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't the shabbiest in the world. Loved it. Ate. In fact, Dad always said I majored in debate and minored in school. So I never made the best grades in the world, but I just ate up debate. And, and the way a debate tournament works is, at least as you move into the upper levels, is that you have six preliminary rounds, three of them you debate affirmative, Three of them, you debate negative. And so it really does teach you to appreciate there is another side. And I think that when we go into these conflicts with a deep appreciation that there is another side, and, and a person who believes the other side is not necessarily evil intended, it actually helps us to go into that conversation at a better spot. Joel, I think this is such an important conversation. Our listeners here on this podcast are large-scale commercial growers from all over the world, including from here in the American Midwest and from California and the West Coast. 
all of us are on our own pathway. We're all on our own journey of learning about the effects that different compounds and causes have in agriculture and how we can improve our overall systems. And every farmer has, as you indicated, all the farmers that I've ever had conversations with have a desire to leave a legacy. They have a desire to leave the soil better for the next generation. They have a good intent and they're all on their own pathway to learning about the challenges of the present mainstream system. This has led me to ask the question, what would have to be true for farmers to really learn the effects more rapidly and desire to shift to a more productive and a more useful agriculture? It's a profound question and one that all of us wrestle with. Uh, No one makes a shift from routine without some sort of disturbance. Just like you don't build muscle without exercising that actually temporarily tears down muscle, and then when it rebuilds, it's actually stronger than the muscle that it, that it replaced. And that's a physical metaphor for what happens you know, in our own lives. Nobody gets up this morning and says, you know, I've been using um, X brand toothpaste for 50 years. For some reason today, I just have a hankering to use Y brand toothpaste. <laughs> no, we, we tend to not embrace change like that we're we're very we're very routinized and we love our routine uh you know we we say that you know what's a rut uh, you know a rut is a is a grave with the ends knocked out we love our routines when you say well what would have to change well what changes is generally things not of our making there are other factors there are things that come in it could be a a, a disease you know this i mean i i know a guy who was a large confinement pig farmer his conversion came one morning when he woke up and he realized my first waking thought when I get up in the morning is, I wonder where a slat broke last night and a pig fell into the slurry pit below. His first waking thought was, wonder what crisis awaits me at the uh, pig house. And he realized, you know, that's not, that's not a good way to farm. And it set him on a course of, you know, seeking a- another approach. So uh, everybody's Everybody's kind of aha moment, awakening testimony, starts with something. I mean, we see it in our customers. Nobody who's been eating at the gas station for 30 years suddenly wakes up in the morning and says, you know, I think I'm going to go to Polyface and get one of those pastured chickens. No, what happens is, after 30 years of eating at the gas station, they get a prognosis of cancer or type 2 diabetes, or they just don't feel good, whatever, and they have this wake-up moment that puts them on a path that they didn't expect to be on yesterday. And so generally, change only comes in crisis. Crisis, you know, in, in Japanese, in the Japanese language, the symbol for crisis is the same symbol for opportunity. You just read it differently based on context. And I just think that's such a beautiful picture. We complain about our crises, but we thank our crises for moving us where we wouldn't normally go. The same thing is true with developing a team. Uh, We have posted in our office, most successful people find that their journey requires them working with somebody they wouldn't normally work with because you have to have complementary skills. You know, if you're an introvert, you probably need an extrovert. If, you, if you're if you an, an engineer type, you probably need a poet. If you're, uh, you know, a, a meticulous uh, routine person, you probably need some sort of a spontaneous, you know, dolphin in your life. And we even see in agriculture, you know, people uh, tend to gravitate toward either animals or plants. And even in plants, they tend to gravitate either toward annuals and produce or, or you know, annuals or, or um, perennials, you know, in orchard and, and bramble fruits and things like that. So you can't embrace, know everything, do everything, be good at everything. Nobody can do that. All the gifts and talents to be successful don't grow on the same pair of legs. Uh, and that's why teams, that's why families work, that's why relationships work, is because we're not singular. 
and we farmers, we are such independent, I call us a bunch of hermit curmudgeons, you know. Uh, most of us are, are, have a better relationship with our tractor than our spouse. Uh, the, you know, the, the tractor never talks back to us, and it's always, you know, uh, starts when we turn the key you know, normally. And, well, and cows the same way, you know, and that's why they're so therapeutic for us because they do express unconditional love. It doesn't matter if we've had a, a difficult day. The cow is always happy to be milked to get a new paddock and grass or whatever. Nobody gets bullied, bad-mouthed, or made fun of from their cow. They're always happy to see you. The point is we have to be grateful for the disruptions in life because they move us places that we would not normally be. I've told people over and over and over again, uh, I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. What I do seem to have a talent for is identifying people who are going places and hooking my wagon to them, then they take me places where I would not have gone on my own. I'd like to dive a bit deeper with this, Joel. It seems to me as though there are two different levels of change. There is the individual level that you described is where you receive an outside incentive to change, something outside of yourself. But then there is also this broader societal change or social change where the societal dynamics and perspectives can shift very rapidly. And you have much more life experience than I am sure you've observed and experienced some examples of this. But one of the things that I have asked myself and have thought about, if we desire to produce a very broad, large-scale change in agriculture quickly, what would have to happen, what would have to be true for the regenerative farmers to be the heroes in the landscape rather than being the farmers who are looked at with raised eyebrows and question marks for them to be the heroes within their own communities i believe when you have that happen when that shift occurs then socially and societally within the farming community we have a pathway towards producing massive change so think about the benchmarks of success that the average farmer uses to describe to describe success. What do you think of when you think of a successful farm? The number one metric most of them use to compare themselves among themselves, which the Bible says is unwise, right. is yield. Yes, that's right. All right, so, so number one is yield. That's bushels per acre, pounds per dairy cow, whatever. It, it's completely yield. Secondly, it's the type of equipment how big a tractor, how, you know, what model tractor, how big a barn, how, uh, you know, it, it, it's infrastructure, it's, it's facilities, okay? Neither of those things, and, and I could go down this list, but we're farmers, we understand farming. In truth, we find that neither of those have, has anything to do with actual profitability or, you know, economic stability, my dad was a was an accountant. He was not a CPA, but he was he was a tax preparer, and he did a lot of work for uh, many of the farmers in the area. He never made a living from the farm. I was the first generation that was able to to, and I stand on the, the shoulders of giants. I acknowledge that. I'm blessed every day that I come from a family who, for two generations, lived a little bit below their means instead of above their means. And gradually, you know, we were able to, to put together a piece of land that then I was able to, to come in and build a, a farm on, a, a business on. But anyway, in the early days, he died young. He was 66. I was 31. I'd come back to the farm full time September 24, 1982. So we only had six years together here on the farm before he passed away. But he would tell me in those early, early struggling days, we weren't making any money. We had no debt, but we didn't make any money. But we didn't have to make much money because we didn't have any expenses. And, you know, we were threadbare. My mentor, Alan Nation, founder of Stockman Grass Farmer, used to always say a profitable farm has a bit of a threadbare look. You know, when people come here to Polyface, they often remark, wow, you know, this this is not glitzy stuff. No, it's not. It's dirt under the fingernails. It's pull yourself up at your bootstraps, it's threadbare stuff, but it's, it's functional, strictly functional. Anyway, he would tell me in those early years we were so struggling, it was financially difficult. Teresa and I were, you know, we were living in the attic, we were living on $300 a month, uh, driving a $50 car, and uh, he would say we were more stable financially 
than the big fat cat, you know, John Deere driving allegedly successful farmers in the area who, I mean, he never told me who all of his clients were. We never knew who they were. He wouldn't even tell us where he was headed when he was going to a client. But he, he would just say, we're more financially stable than a lot of these guys driving big trucks and big tractors, not because we made a bunch of money, but because our balance sheet was more stable. How you become a hero is you outlast everybody and you out integrity everybody because you're the one that pays your bills. You're the one that's happy to be farming. You're not trying to figure out how to get out. You're the one whose children want to stay in farming. And they say, well, why in the world would your kids want to stay in farming? Well, because, you know, it's a great place to be. Well, our farm stinks and doesn't make any money, dusty and drudgery and chores, rah, 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 you know. But half the farmers I know really don't want their kids to be farmers. And so our culture has not been in a farm denigrating mindset for that long. We've only been in a farm denigrating mindset since about 19, whatever, 1960. Prior to 1960, farmers were revered, they were honored, they were pillars of their community, they were set on bank boards, they were um, honored in, in society. But since about 19, mid-60s, late-60s, farmers have moved into the hillbilly, redneck dregs of society rather than the pillars of society. That may change. Uh, you know, you go to Spain, and uh, when you realize that the, the guy who knows how to prune the cork tree to produce the greatest number of acorns for the acorn-finished Iberico pork, that fellow is revered in the community and earns as much as a heart surgeon. That's a different culture. That is a very different culture. I think that in our culture, we have denigrated now, I don't know how else to say it, look, Nobody has gone to their high school guidance counselor. I, I tell this, make this joke everywhere I go, and I've never had anybody refute it. Nobody's ever gone to their guidance counselor in our lifetime. And you go in there, you're, you know, you're a rising senior. The guidance counselor says, wow, you know, Mary or, or Jim, wow, you've got really good grades. You're sharp. In fact, you know, you're so sharp, you should be a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we laugh at that joke? Why is that funny? And really, at reality, it's not funny. No, it, it's not. It's absolutely not funny. And that's why. That's why when people ask me what kind of farming do you do, I joke all. Uh, my first response is always uh, profitable, and that always throws them for a loop. Prof what farming profit? You know, I mean, it's, it's a lot more than profitable farming. But I find that by just quickly responding, what kind of farming do you do? Oh, profitable. That's not what they're expecting. It really starts a conversation down a different pathway than even they were expecting. And I think that as we farmers in our movement, we need to be thinking about what long-term legacy value brings honor. Being the, the top producer or having the biggest tractor, you know, all that means is that the, a, a bigger estate sale. And... At the end of the day, we need to be putting profit along with production and realizing that if we pay our bills and we have places that people enjoy coming, a haven where it's a farm that smells good, looks pretty, is relationally healthy. My biggest joy is when visitors come to our farm, their CEOs or different people from around the world, they come and as they leave, they say, all of your people are happy. And that reminds me of the way Queen of Sheba, you know, when she came to visit Solomon, and she said, even your butlers and your, your slaves and your staff have a beautiful countenance. They're, they're happy. And we encourage that. We, we want a place where we are doing sacred work, and there's a deep level of happiness in doing sacred, righteous, big-picture stuff. This reminds me of a comment that you made in The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. And by the way, Joel, I read widely, as you do. I've always enjoyed reading and read quite quickly. 
Many people over the years have asked me to put together a recommended reading list to learn more deeply specifically about agronomy. And I put it together recently and shared with a group of people the only book on a list of 50-some books that I gave a must-read recommendation was The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs. So thank you for sharing that and putting it out there. That's very kind. You made a comment that agriculture needs to reclaim the moral high ground. We have given up the moral high ground because of the pillaging or, uh, yeah, I'll just use that word, because of the pillaging types of practices, the degradation of soil health and agricultural ecosystems that we have propagated as a result of our management practices. I'm reminded of this comment and what you just described is that to be a hero and to leave a legacy, we really need to reclaim the moral high ground and not be the people who are damaging ecosystems on the planet. Well, yes, yes. And this is why I'll just be blunt and say that the lie of you've got to produce this to feed the world is such a... It's a recipe for disaster on so many levels. If you travel to Africa, the third, if you travel to third world countries, they are rich in resources. And many times their struggle is not because they don't have resources or because they don't have a market or anything like that. It is socioeconomic. No country is responsible nor emotionally extorted to have to feed the world. Ultimately, Communities must feed themselves. And, boy, if there's one thing that we're learning in this coronavirus uh, pandemic, it is the value of communities being able to feed themselves. When commerce breaks down, when there's a glitch, you want a community that can feed itself. This burden on the back of farmers that they walk around hunched over with this burden of, I have to feed the world, I have to feed the world, and If I'm successful at that, then I'm successful. But that burden makes farmers lose soil. Uh, It makes farmers produce bushels of material that is nutrient deficient, not nutrient dense. So the nutrition goes down. The quality goes down. It's more uh, susceptible to fungal attack or, you know, aflatoxins or a million different things. It's equivalent to a pastor thinking, well, I have to save the world. No, if that's your your mantra, you're going to cheat, cut corners, uh, do anything possible to, you know, get people in the pews, to put money in the offering plate, to do all sorts of things. That's not going to build a legacy that lasts. So farmers have to understand that there is a a much bigger program, a much bigger protocol going on than just I have to go out here today and feed the world. No, you have to steward and take care of things. You have to, first of all, you have to take care of your soil, and you have to take care of your animals or your plants. You have to produce the best animals and plants that can be produced. You know, that's stewardship. The difference between conquistador uh, mentality, pillaging, of, of taking what, what I can as fast as I can, uh, the difference between that and long-term stewardship where I've been given talents, and as long as the master is away, I'm trying to increase those talents for the master so that when the master returns, and of course, if God created this and it's and the, ultimately the universe is God's, then we should be asking, well, how do I give God a, a return on his investment? Is a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico, is that a good return on, on investment? If, if you own the world, would you be happy with aquifer depletion soil erosion, dead zones, pollution, species extinction, millions of acres uh, being, for example, you know, monocrops as opposed to polycrops, polyspecies, and you know, diversified plants and animals. What would you want out of this investment? If we start thinking about it that way, I think it can really help us you know, get a handle on where we need, need to each go with our own individual place. It's, it's not okay to see a big gully develop in your field. It's, it's not okay to need more things that end in C-I-D-E, the Latin suffix for death. It, it's not okay to see a depletion in fertility, to have to have 
to see the soil harden and have to get a bigger tractor because the old one can't pull it through the hardening soil anymore. That's not okay. That That's a general, it happens slowly and insidiously. But the idea of wearing out land is completely foreign in the abundance lexicon. We, because of our footsteps, should be seeing the land more productive every year. We should see our animals healthier, our vet bills decline. That is all a part of the abundance mentality. This mantra of needing to feed the world really originated as a marketing slogan of large-scale agribusiness to promote a certain type of agriculture, what is presently called mainstream agriculture or conventional agriculture. The mantra has been swallowed hook, line, and sinker by mainstream producers and farmers because it feels emotionally rewarding and fulfilling on one level. And yet, it is really the mantra at the foundation of an agriculture where soil is the biggest export. We export more soil and topsoil than we do grain. I find it really interesting. We call this conventional agriculture. It's been conventional only in recent history, but according to the UN FAO, small-scale, smallholder agriculture produces 70% of the global food supply and uses 30% of the inputs. Think about what that means for the inverse. It means that everything that we presently call mainstream or conventional agriculture produces 30% of the global food supply using 70% of the inputs. That is a description of a dysfunctional system in the field. And then, as you mentioned a moment ago, we're also seeing the system dysfunction and breakdown on the processing side in the present environment with coronavirus and everything that's happening in dairy and beef. It's very sad, not just those two, but in a broad array of different crops to see the processing has become so centralized that we have a very weakened system. And I think one of the next steps is we have to look at how we can reclaim that system and no longer have the centralization. Well, yes, and these kinds of discussions as they flow, like you and I are having, it's easy for a commercial large-scale farmer to suddenly feel uncomfortable, like, oh, here he goes again, demonizing size. Size is automatically evil or wrong or whatever. And I think right here it's important to point out we're not talking about scale and size per se. We're talking about a centralization. Let me give you an example. Right now, look, we've been in business a long time. We're not a huge farm, although a lot of people, you know, when you hit, I mean, this year we'll probably hit $3 million in sales. A lot of people would say, well, that's a pretty big farm. And according to the USDA, it is a big farm. But why does it have such a small farm feel? Well, because rather than centralizing, we have expanded by duplication, by decentralized duplication as opposed to concentration. For example, if we raise 100,000 chickens, they're not going to be in two great big poultry houses. They're going to be in 300 little field shelters that we move every day with human labor not tractors and machines, so it's very human-centric, and these are scattered on our home farm. We rent about 12 farms in the area, and so they're scattered at other places, and we move them around from farm to farm. We move our, we move our, our personnel around from place to place, and so, yes, it's a lot of chickens. Sure, it's a lot of chickens, but it's not centralized in one spot. We're very mindful of placing them where the soil needs the fertility, where, uh, you know, people can access it easily. We're very cognizant of that whole um, womb uh, umbilical carrying capacity of the, of the ecological nest as to where we place these things. There's no smell. There's no flies. Uh, it's completely portable, you know, mobile uh, infrastructure. So say, so, well, uh, we need to get these chickens uh, slaughtered. We need to get them butchered. So what kind of processing facility, you know, thinking out to the future, well, what if, you know, what, what if we were doing a million chickens? All right, let's just say it's really successful and we were doing a, a million chickens. Well, what would that look like? 
Well, then you start thinking about human scale and ecological carrying capacity. And so, for example, you know, Dave Schaefer of uh, Featherman Plucker fame has put together a cool poultry slaughter deal where he gets these um, used shipping containers. He has some Amish Mennonite folks down in Missouri that will take these containers and refurbish them into small little uh, mobile processing facilities. So, you know, for 100000 bucks, you can uh, throw a chassis under that, bring it, deliver it to anywhere in the country, set it on four pillars, and boom, you're in, you're in the processing business under federal inspection. Let's assume we want federal inspection. Now, can they do a million a year? No, they can't. They can only do about one hundred and twenty to 140000 a year. But guess what? If we place those in farmland that can handle the real-time processing water, now we don't have to be in the hazardous sewage business. We don't have to have slurry ponds, and we take what the industry has as toxic waste and is a major cost factor to clean up. We use that as fertigation in real time because we're not overrunning, and if every time we need another you know, 140, 150,000 uh, bird capacity, we don't increase the central structure. We simply choose another piece of land over here with its you know, 30 acres that can handle all of the processing water in real time as fertigation, and we set another one over there, and we set another one over here, and we set another one over here. And so we, we scale by duplication rather than by centralization. That is an incredibly democratized way to scale that's in direct opposition to the centralized, concentrated mentality of the factory processing system and factory production system. So I don't want anybody listening to think that, you know, we have some sort of a vendetta against size. It's not size at all. It's how that size is structured. I think absolutely we can have 5,000 cow, 10,000 cow operations, but they're not going to be structured in a typical, you know, centralized, confined way. And that decentralization creates resilience, which is so badly needed in today's world. Joel, one of the questions that I'm often asked that I would love to ask you as well is when we consider all of the social changes, societal changes that have taken place in the last couple of decades and that are likely to take place in the next couple of decades, we live in very uncertain times, of course, and none of us can predict the future necessarily, but what changes do you anticipate happening over the next few years? Where do you see the big opportunities and what direction would you advise young farmers to really pursue? That's a hard question. A, I'm not a prophet, and in fact, I collect I collect bogus prophecies. I have a whole file. I've been collecting them all my life, and it's really amazing. Whenever I see somebody make a big prediction, I clip it and put it in this file, and it's really hilarious now to go back 40, 50 years and see the kinds of predictions that, that people made that, you know, did not come to pass at all. I'm pretty, that's the one thing that I am scared to do is, is make predictions. What I can say is here's where trends seem to be moving. The reason that I don't know where we're headed is because I think that there is still a very big battle for the heart and soul of the food system, whether it's going to go to you know, LED-lighted vertical hydroponic uh, factory stuff in, you know, cities, uh, which is, of course, what the Bill Gates and the, you know, the, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh at my own joke. I never thought about this. That That is a new Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> LED vertical light farming is the new Illuminati. Anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. Um, anyway, you know, is is that going to be where it goes? And of course, you know, we've got this, you know, Norwegian company that's uh, making yeast. They're piping hyper oxygen into a yeast chamber and creating supposedly every kind of food stuff you can imagine just out of this um, air that's fed yeast. I, I don't understand all about it, but it, you know, the kind of of um, Star Trek food stuff that we're seeing. I mean, including Impossible Burger and, and Beyond Beef and all this stuff. 
uh, vat, you know, vat-produced proteins and things. There is a lot of money being poured into that right now, and frankly, a lot of uh, cultural equity being poured into it as well. The whole Eat Lancet report, the UN, law, you know, demonizing livestock, demonizing animals. Uh, you know, cows are destroying the planet, and blah 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 blah. I don't actually know which way this things are going to go. If we're going to go to a you know a vegan future, uh, I mean, there are there are now local ordinances being framed that uh, want to create special eating sections for meat eaters, like a smoking section, so the meat eaters don't have to be housed with the non-meat eaters. There are numerous ordinances being proposed for a meat tax that would put like a you know a 50% tax on meat because it damages the environment. I don't know where those things are going. It's if you dwell on it very much, you can get a little bit discouraged. Here is what has stood the test of time. And so, when I wrote a book, folks, this ain't normal. I, I went back and looked at what has been the template of time and. The template of time is that the sun, S-U-N, drives this through chlorophyll, through photosynthetic activity, to build soil, and nobody in all the high-tech programs, uh, hydroponics or anything else, and nobody has been able to reproduce the nutrient complexity the full spectrum of ratios and nutrient balance that comes from soil-grown food. So it seems to me like after all the smoke clears and after all the technology does its thing, that there will be a place for well-grown, well-maintained, soil-grown anything. (laughs) Once all the experimenters have gone through their fads and their experiments, just like, you know, hydrogenated vegetable oil was the darling of the, you know, dietitians and nutritionists for decades, and now not only are you not supposed to eat very much of it, the actual uh, recommended daily allowance is zero. It's turned from darling to demon in 50 years. That's a pretty big change. And it's very conceivable to me that some of this impossible burger beyond meat, vegetarianism, veganism, uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing things about the microbiome, the essential fatty acids in the brain, brain development, Alzheimer's, there are all sorts of cool things that we're seeing. And one of the things that we're finding is God's creation is a fearfully and wonderfully made thing that has certain rules. There, there are rules. There's an order. There's an order to it. And you can't just go in like a swashbuckling, you know, uh, pirate and um, adulterate, obliterate, disrespect that order. And so the soil is built primarily with perennials. So we want fewer annuals, more perennials as much as possible. And we want an integrated food supply, not a segregated food supply. So the thing that will stand the test of time is anyone who figures out how to link up, for example, their pig operation to a cheese-making operation so that you relink this. The whey doesn't go to a landfill. The whey goes to the pigs. And food scraps, I mean, 50% of landfill waste is edible scraps. Well, those shouldn't go to a landfill. They should go to a chicken. You know, and the chicken can eat that and make eggs out of it. But you can't do that if the chickens are segregated in a factory in Iowa that's fed corn from Illinois, that's fertilized for material from the Middle East. We have completely segregated. So the food systems I see of the future are going to be places that actually build soil, that can actually build nutrient density, that can fill the full spectrum of the human microbiome and nutritional need, with a fully integrated system where you have um, a, a complex relationships with plants and plants, plants and animals, animals and animals, and this primarily a regionally secure thing. In other words, where the fertility to run it, the energy to run it, the inputs, the outputs, 
and the cycle is regional as opposed to global and therefore susceptible to all these you know breaks in chains and uh, whatever disagreements between nations and things like that rather it would be more community regionally based when you put that together as a package integrated regional soil developed carbon centric people oriented you put that together and you realize oh well that's what has stood the test of time since the beginning of civilization and that's the way that's the way I will bet for the future. Joel, there's one specific aspect of this I'd like to dive into a bit deeper. I recall a conversation that you and I had across the dinner table about that's a number of years ago. And I asked the question, what would have to happen or what would have to be true for mainstream Midwest grain production, corn and soybean production, to shift to a grazing grass-fed beef production model because it was my understanding at that time and still is today that particularly with corn prices where they are now that you can actually make more money and be more profitable producing grass-fed beef at market prices than you can growing corn for some reason i thought that math came from you can you enlighten me if i'm thinking about that correctly Sure. Yes, indeed. And that's one of the, my funnest things I do when I get into a bunch of um, uh, crop farmers from the Midwest. And so what I do, I, I, I say, okay, we're going we're gonna to grow corn. I don't grow corn, so you're going to have to give me the numbers. You know, and they give me the numbers on whatever, you know, fertilizer, uh, planting costs, diesel fuel, equipment depreciation, blah, blah, blah. And, and you, come up with, you come up with a number per acre seed. You come up with a number per acre of, of expenses harvest, all those things. What are you going to get paid for this? Well, of course, that's always fun <laughs> because you have, you have the optim, optimists remembering what they got, you know, four years ago, the pessimists, you know, looking at what they got this year. <laughs> and so anyway, but, but it, it's a fun exercise. Everybody finally comes up. And generally, generally, it comes out to in the neighborhood of, of uh, $50 uh, a profit per acre comes out to around 50 to, you know, 75, 80 bucks an acre. That's kind of a, sometimes obviously it can be zero, but generally it's in the 50, somewhere between $1,500 an acre on corn. All right. So then we go, okay, <clears throat> now we're going to, we're going to grow some, we're going to instead put this in grass and grow calves. Now the, the number that the farmers have to, that, that I supply that they don't know is that the, Equivalent amount, if you're growing 100 bushel an acre dry land corn, land that will grow 100 bushel an acre corn will produce 400 cow day grass. In other words, that's grass that will support 400 cow days per year, which is a little over one, you know, uh, one cow per acre. Obviously, land that only produces 50 bushel corn will only do 200 cow day, you know, per year. And if land that will produce 200 bushel an acre uh, corn will do 800 cow days per acre. So the 100 to 400 is pretty uh, consistent. Well, let's just go with 100 because that's nice and conservative. And uh, no, you know, most farmers would, would say 100 is a little bit low uh, today. Most farmers would want, well, you know more about this than I do, but, you know, they'd want in the 150 range probably. Let's just assume 100, for example, because it's easier to do the math in your head. Uh, so 100, we're going we're, to 400 cow equivalents. So that's 600 stalker equivalents because a stalker is a, a little more than half of a cow. So the 600 stalker equivalents. So we're going we're gonna to get these calves at you know 500 pounds. What are they going to, you know, they're going to grow, uh, you know, and, of course, again, the, the rubble farmers, you know, they sit here and they, they throw out these numbers. And, and so let's be very conservative and say this calf only gains a pound and a quarter a day, and we're going to keep it for 200 days. 200 days at a pound and a quarter is 300 pounds, and we're going to buy that calf for, you know, X amount. They give me a number. We're going to sell it for the X amount. They give me a number. The point is that every one of those, that pound and a quarter of gain per day is, let's just say that it's worth 
Let's just say it's worth a dollar fifty, just for sake of discussion. That pound and a quarter a day is worth a dollar fifty. Okay. So then we put our expenses in. We're going to have mineral hauling, labor, you know, moving them around. You know, there's really no equipment. There's no fertilizer. There's no planting. There's no harvesting. That's all pretty well done. You might have a four wheeler that you have to depreciate to go take care of them, but you know, the, the costs are, are, are primarily labor hauling mineral. And you're going to have some mortality. There's going to be some, some death loss. The point is that um, at a dollar fifty per cow day, even if we chop that substantially to a dollar per day times six hundred stalker days is six hundred dollars per acre. You take off your expenses. I've done this all over the place, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, in the Midwest, and it always, no matter what the price of cattle is, uh, no matter anything, it always comes out into the, you know, the two to three hundred dollars per acre range, sometimes more, but for sake of discussion right now, let's just say it comes out to three hundred dollars per acre. Well, there's nobody, nobody that's netting $300 $300 per acre on corn. So what's funny is, as you, as you finish this exercise, you know, these guys they kind of sit there, and then, then the first one, you know, he starts to chuckle. And then another one chuckles. They say, well, what are we raising corn for? And so I asked Alan Nation. He's the first one that kind of went through this with me. I asked him one time, I said, well, if this actually became widely adopted, then corn prices would plummet because nobody would grow it. He said, oh, no. He said exactly the opposite. Corn prices would triple because that's what it would take to get people to plant it. So you would have to match the uh, the reward sure. of growing beef. Absolutely. Yeah. And guess what? Guess what? As soon as corn tripled, guess what would happen to pork and chicken? The beef. It would go up. The beef it, it, would, it would become even more valuable. Because, because those are omnivores. They can't just eat grass like an herbivore. And so if you read Jefferson's ag book, Thomas Jefferson's, he kept copious notes. And if you read his ag book and look at the ratios in there, it's amazing up until very, very modern times, the ratios were incredible as to what you know beef and pork and chicken were and corn were worth if you take those ratios, uh, for example, in his day, the cow value was 10 times a turkey. Today, it's 50 times. So in his day, a turkey was worth 10 times a cow. If you went and bought a turkey, it was worth 10 times what a cow was. Today, a I think you mean 10% 50, of what a cow was. It's 50 times, yeah, yeah, a cow. And you can just go through this, and the ratios are amazing to see the difference. And, and what, so what would happen is, if this were widely understood and large swaths of the prairie were returned back to prairie with herbivores intensively managed grazing on them, the grain prices would go way up, and that would make poultry go way up, pork go way up, and suddenly... Beef, the, the herbivores, the beef and the lamb folks would be the everyman meat again, which is the way it was throughout uh, until very modern days, and the uh, poultry would be the luxury. I mean, that's why President Truman said his vision for America was a chicken in every pot. Today he would say a ribeye steak on every grill. But back in those days, chicken was extremely expensive, and so he said a chicken in every pot because the idea was everybody's going to eat like kings. And back in the day, poultry was always the luxury because grain was simply too expensive to feed the poultry. Only only royalty and noblemen had enough wherewithal to be able to feed poultry uh, grain and have it on demand. Otherwise, it was, well, you know, we have chicken, you know, once or twice a year for festive occasions uh, because that's the only time there's enough extra vegetables and potato skins and you know, uh, home, homestead scraps to be able to fatten up a couple chickens that we can eat. Otherwise, it's lamb and uh, lamb and beef. It is interesting to think about how this 
shift might change the production landscape in the Midwest. All of a sudden, you no longer need nearly the grain infrastructure capacity, the tractors, the combines, all the fancy equipment, the rail yards, changes dynamic significantly and eliminates all the beef CAFOs as well, which is something else that is an interesting ecological dynamic. The interesting thing, yes, you're exactly right. Uh, the interesting thing is that grain, um, the transcontinental railroad, the, the whole railroad system was essentially built on Midwest grain. Uh, one of the reasons why the you know subsidies and grain programs developed was in order to give the trains, which initially were not profitable, they needed freight. And when the first trains went out to the mid, there was no freight to carry. They didn't have factories and and you know and and things to to carry. Uh, and so the quickest first freight was grain. And so if we can encourage through federal policy, if we can encourage grain production, then we'll give the railroad something to carry, the railroads can be profitable, and we can now have a great country. The close symbiosis between railroads and Midwestern grain is really embedded in our, in our nation's uh, DNA. You used the phrase earlier when you were describing this 100 bushel per corn equals 400 cow days of grazing of grass. You mentioned that you used the phrase that if this were widely known, it could really shift the production dynamics in, in the landscape. And you've obviously been speaking to this for a number of years. How many growers have actually made the shift and the change? Oh, a handful. <laughs> Not not very many. Well, you know, look, first of all, nobody, again, nobody wants to admit that their routine has been wrong. That's just human nature. We, we don't want to admit that we've been doing the wrong thing. We want to think we've been doing the right thing. And so there's a stigma. There's a strong stigma to to admitting we're going we're gonna to make a change. Uh, you know, I just, I just was last week emailing back and forth with a young 21-year-old aspiring young farmer. He's one of four sons in a confinement dairy operation in uh, Michigan. You know, they're milking almost 2,000 cows in confinement. They're $4 million in debt. He loves farming, but he hates the family farm. And he says, you know, how can I, what can I do? So anyway, I, I've been back and forth with him. We met personally, oh, I don't know, six months ago. Make a long story short, he's got his first 300 broilers coming. He's going to put them on pasture and portable shelters, and he's got his first uh, 12 pigs coming. He's going to direct market, building up his customers. And bless his heart, his dad and his family has given him a, a little bit of – a lot of families wouldn't, wouldn't allow that, you know. But fortunately, his – he just comes from a very unusual family where they're willing to let him have a little bit of, of rain and try something. You know, it's it's just one person at a time, and and I think that as long as people can make it, uh, they just well, my wife says they they don't know any better. You know, they just this is all you know. You don't realize how hard it is to make a change. I'll give you a personal story. You know, people think I'm a I'm an innovator. I'm creative. I yeah, and and I am. I, I yeah, I know I am. Uh, but listen. Oh, shoot, 30, I don't know what, not 30, 25 years ago, uh, we started doing eggs in a pretty good-sized way. And so what we were familiar with was our little portable field shelters with chickens. And so I built a fleet of those to put a 1,000 layers, 50 in, a, in each shelter, and had 20 of these shelters, moved them along the pasture, and uh, it worked extremely well. Boy, we thought we had the the cat's meow, you know, and we were on the front page of Acres USA magazine, and and uh, this was the cool thing. Well, here a, a visitor came, uh, Michael Plain and Joyce, his wife from uh, Australia. He came up, looked at this. He looked at me, shook his head. He said, "This is obsolete." Well, I was offended. What do you mean this is obsolete? Uh, I was on the front page of Acres USA magazine. What do you mean I'm obsolete? No, this is obsolete. He said, "There's a new." Of course, you know. You had to love him because of his wonderful Australian accent. And he said there's this new um, netting material, electrified netting. It was invented in Germany. 
And he said, I got some of it, and it's it's the slickest thing in the world. And you know, you can move it around. It's electrified. He keeps the he keeps the varmints out. Keeps the chickens in. And I said, Well, how high is it? Well, it's you know, it's 42 inches. I said, Well, chickens will jump out of it. You know, I had every everything. He said, Well, you know, all I can say is you're obsolete. Well, boy, I I, I chewed on that, chewed on that for three years. For three years, I chewed on that, and finally. I said, you know what, I'm just going to get a piece of this fence and just so I can prove to myself that it doesn't work, so I can confirm my thoughts, because I know I'm right on this. There's no way it can work. I got a piece of it from Premier and set it up. I remember it like yesterday. I went up there. I got one piece of it. I went up, and I encircled one of the shelters, and then I picked up a corner, put a five-gallon bucket under it so the chickens could all come out. I got another five-gallon bucket, went over there and sat outside, to watch it not work. <laughs> <laughs> and in in five minutes, in five minutes, I said, Michael was right. And I ran down to the house. I told Teresa, I said, Michael and Joyce were right. We are obsolete. We're making this change today. And we did, and now we run the Millennium Feathernet. We run whatever, 5,000 layers in, you know, 25% of the labor. The chickens are happier I mean, it's just, it was a revolutionary thing for us financially, from a labor stand, and even from a chicken uh, health standpoint, and an egg quality standpoint. I mean, it, everything, everything was positive. And yet it took me three years to try something. Why? Because I was emotionally invested. I I built those shelters. I conceived those shelters. This was my baby. This was This was the model. I was emotionally invested in it, and it struck me, looking back on that, if it took me three years to make that level of adjustment from one kind of portable pasture layer model to a different kind of portable pasture layer model, imagine these guys who've grown up running corn planters and you know, spreading fertilizer and running a combine and big trucks and and all of the the fraternity and the 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 emotional affirmation. The who am I? Who am I? Well, I'm a I'm a I'm a farmer that grows corn and soybeans in Indiana or Iowa. You know, our, our whole identity and affirmation and our self confidence. It's all wrapped up in this emotional thing that this routine. And, boy, to change that is just, well, Alan Nation used to tell me, he said, it's easier to change the person than change the, the person's model or change the person's mind. And his thing was it's so embedded that literally a lot of farmers have to go out of business, retire. Many of them are committing suicide. I mean, there's tremendous problems in this commodity agriculture sector. It sounds harsh to say it. I think that, that that is correct, that it, it literally ta- takes a changing of the guard. It, change, it takes a, a changing of the land ownership and the people on it in hard times before something else actually can be done. So it truly is adapt or die. Yes, yes, it, it, it really die. is. And it, it sounds horrible, but that's a, you know, that's a, that's a normal thing. You, goodness, you... I mean, it's the way it is in marriage. I mean, you either learn to get along or you, or you don't survive. You know, and um, and so you have to adapt. If if she wants a squeezed toothpaste tube and you want a rolled one, well, is that a hill you're going to die on? Or are you just going to start squeezing it? <laughs> <laughs> Joel, you you speak to many different farmer groups, and uh, you've spoken to many different farmers over the years. What are conversations that you would like to have more often, but you sense that it makes farmers uncomfortable. Oh, my, that's an easy one. The number one elephant in the room is succession. What happens if you die tomorrow? Nobody wants to talk about it. At Stockman Grass Farmer Magazine, where I'm the editor now since Alan has passed away, uh, we've really put attention on this over the last year and a half. We did our first succession school last fall. We couldn't get people to come. And I warned them at the magazine. I said, yeah, you want to do this? I want to do it. We all, we all know it's the elephant in the room. 
but it's the, it's the taboo subject. Nobody wants to talk about it. I don't know how to punch through that. I mean, I guess nobody, this isn't unique to farmers, nobody likes to talk about, you know, estate planning and, and that sort of thing. But, but with farmers, it's so important because you have the complication of the land, which is really not, it's not worth anything unless you sell it. But if you sell it, then you don't have anything but money. And, and farmers, you know, farmers are not just business people. We, we love our land. I mean, if somebody walked in today and said, I'll pay you, you know, $10 million for your land, I'd say, go get lost. I wouldn't, it isn't for sale, you know. And yeah. there's an aspect of this. Yeah, succession, succession is absolutely the conversation. And the fact that the average farmer is now 60 years old, in the next sixty-five, in the in the next fifteen years, fifty percent of America's farmland is going to change hands. Now you know you could quibble over that whether it's fifty or forty percent or whatever. But the point is that we're going to have a massive, massive changing of land and equipment and building ownership over the next fifteen years. Who's going to be in control of that? When we punch out of this, the point is this level of agrarian equity transfer has not happened in any civilization in history. It's only happened in conquest. You know, the Huns come in and sack Rome or, or <laughs> you know, uh, Genghis Khan sweeps across Europe. I mean, it, it's happened in conquest, but it's never happened in, in peace, just a peaceful transition of this magnitude. So we're in very uncharted waters, and coming out of this on the other end, I don't think anybody right now knows what that's going to look like. And and now we've got the coronavirus complicating things, which I think is going to have a long tail of political and economic consequences, from government intrusion to whatever. I get letters from 80-year-old farmers saying, can you find me a young person to inherit my farm too. I don't want to give it to my kids. They'll just sell it. I love this place too much to just watch it developed or sold to anybody. And I'm looking around, well, where's the young person? And, you know, young people, oh, yeah, pick me, pick me. And you bring them in, and in a month, well, they don't want to get up at 5 o'clock. They don't want to, they want to have a cup of coffee on the veranda until 8 o'clock, until they, you know, go out and start. And I mean, not all. I don't want to be overgeneralistic, but this is one of the reasons why we're so excited about the kind of farming that we do here at Polyface because it is, it's not capital intensive and it's highly mobile. And so when you have mobile infrastructure and you have high management, so your equity is in skill and information and not in infrastructure. The average farm in America, it takes $4 worth of depreciable equity to generate a dollar in annual gross sales. So if a farm is generating $100,000 in annual gross sales, it will normally have $400,000 worth of buildings and equipment to generate that $100,000. Our farm here, our ratio is 50 cents to a dollar. So if we're generating $100,000 in sales, we only have 50,000 in buildings and equipment. That's a big difference in actual capital costs versus cash flow. And so that's why we're excited about, I mean, not just for us, because we, you know, we're doing okay, but for the generation of young people coming on and why we run our stewardship program, our apprenticeship program, is to actually teach these ways so that our young people, we've got young people that have left our program and no money, no equity, no land, no nothing, and they're full-time farming, placing, for example, a pastured poultry enterprise on an existing beef operation, with, you know, with an old geezer that's running his beef cows. I could put a pastured poultry operation on any beef cow operation, grain operation. Goodness, let's put the grain through the animals we raise ourselves instead of going down to the elevator. How about I pay you an extra 25 cents a bushel, you raise GMO free, I'll do the animals because, you know, you like to go to the Caribbean for uh, three months in the winter. And when you don't have grain crops, you go ahead and I'm not going to affect your lifestyle. I'm a young person. I'll do the animals. I'll feed your grain through the omnivores, direct market them, and uh, and you can continue doing your grain farming until you're done. Anyway, there are all these cool relational collaborative arrangements so that young people can get in, and it's all enabled by having mobile, modular 
management intensive infrastructure as opposed to centralized high capital stationary concentrated infrastructure it's one of the most liberating things for a young person to be able to enter this vocation debt free and land free because your farm business is actually mobile your customers are mobile your farm business is mobile and it can be placed on somebody else's equity anywhere. And if things go south and the relationship breaks up, you can just take your farm business and move it somewhere else. This is the nimbleness of tomorrow's place. We have not in agriculture developed a nimble protocol. It's an extremely non-nimble protocol. And if you read any business books today, you know that as we move into the future, One of the trend lines is it's not about being big, it's about being nimble. As you said, John, it's about adaptability to changing things. So what we see right now is we see people buying on the Internet. Uh, We see door-to-door delivery. Uh, We see so, so, you know, our farm teams have to have somebody that's social media savvy, a good communicator, a good Instagrammer that can use electronic media for both sales and messaging to build these links and relationships with our customers. And, you know, the distribution picture is we've already got, you know, FedEx and Amazon, but we're seeing, like in our area, we're seeing a proliferation of what we call a man in a van, a very, very tiny little nimble outfits with one and two vans that are essentially food couriers. And there's a whole sub, you know, movement here of distribution that's nipping at the heels of FedEx and UPS and some on a regional level. They're not going global, but they're just regional. But because they're nimble and they're small and they're low capitalized, they can actually undercut on a local regional uh, business. They can actually do even better. So you know, these are these are trend lines that we see. This is such an exciting conversation, Joel, and I'm really I'm really happy to be having this conversation because. There is the challenge of succession, but succession is about more than just a transfer of equity. It's also a transfer of skills. And like you, I get many emails from people at both ends of the spectrum, older farmers who want to have young people take over their operation, but also many young people, even particularly many from a non-farming background, have a desire to get into farming. And you and I both know that the skill level required to be a successful farmer, you, you can't just transfer from an unfarming background and expect to be successful. And so there's the model that you're describing gives those people who truly have the grit and determination and the wherewithal to be successful an easy entry without a colossal failure potential. Yes. Well, look, if you want to raise chickens, in the commercial model, the first thing you have to do is build a half a million dollar uh, chicken facility. But if you want to raise chickens with us, or, or in our model, all you need is about 300 bucks to build a pastured shelter, and you start, and if you're good at it and you enjoy it, then you can build a second one, and you can build a third one. And so, you know, we now have the equivalent <laughs> more than a Cargill or, you know, a Tyson a chicken house, but they're, they're all these little uh, little portable shelters that we can place at different different fields, different farms, different plate, different times, different people can operate them, and they're completely separate from the land base. The single biggest cost of farming is land, but if you don't have to capitalize the land and you can jump in, I mean, this, this, is, why, this is why a little uh, one-and-a-half-acre intensive, you know, spin spin farming, the sustainable produce intensive, whatever, I don't know what the end is, but anyway, you generate, you know, $150,000 on an acre of very, very intensively run uh, a place. I mean, the uh, Singing Frogs Farm in Petaluma, California, they're one of my, you know, heroes. Uh, a couple came in, they were not farmers. They bought five acres, and this land was $50,000 an acre. It was in Petaluma, California, but they actually cash flowed it through their produce operation. Now, they can grow 12 months of the year, but they use techniques, for example, where they can they use starter trays. So they take all that early seedling phase, run that in starter trays, 
So the only thing that actually goes in the ground is an actual plant from juvenile to maturity, and that way they can actually, on some of their stuff, they can actually get 12 crops in a year per square foot. Well, suddenly, you know, you're, you're into the $200,000 an acre income, and that works. But it's extremely skill, knowledge, and management intensive. The single most important piece of equity that any farmer has is experience. And you can't Google experience. So when somebody asks me, you know, I want to farm, what should I do? I say, you know, get experience. And this isn't about organic, non-organic, commercial, not commercial. The fact is over half of what we do on the farm, building a fence, fixing a trailer hitch, how to back a trailer, basic stuff, that's not organic or inorganic. It's just regular life experience. That's the most important equity you can have going into it. These nimble, low-capital, flexible systems. I mean, Michael Abelman up in um, Vancouver, you know, he's got entire portable uh, produce operations that he uses uh, Rubbermaid tanks, fills them with spent um, you know, mushroom media, and takes them to vacant lots in the city. You know, he's rehabbing druggies and gang members and all sorts of stuff. There is workforce, and they get their hands in the soil, start growing plants, do this in vacant cities, vacant lots. I mean, he's got one five-acre farm under the under almost under a stadium, an old defunct uh, stadium in a parking lot. It's revolutionary, and if the city decides, well, we're going to build something here, then they just load all these things up on a low boy and move them to another lot. And so the entire farm operation, the entire thing is portable. That's nimbleness, and I think that that holds a lot of promise for the future, especially in uncertain times. I mean, the more uncertain times are, the more nimbleness you need. Joel, I want to go back to the succession conversation. I think there's a very important question that needs to be asked, and that is uh, what advice do you have for people on both ends of that spectrum, both for the older people who desire to transition and for the young people who want to enter in? First of all, let's talk about the guy my age. You know, in your 60s, you're on your way out, and you're thinking about next steps. Do you know somebody who wants it, whether it's family or non-family? Sometimes it's non-family. Sometimes nobody in the family actually wants it, but but the kids don't want it sold. They grew up there. They have a love for the place, blah, 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 you know, legacy, family, name, blah, blah, blah. So they don't want to sell it, but they don't want to actually farm it. The question is, who's going to run it? Who's going to plant it? Who's going to move the cows? Who's going to do this? Once you settle on that, then you have to come together. And, and often, often it's one. It's one of the children, not all of them, but one. If you're really fortunate, you might get, you might have two that are interested. But in general, you know, you have to figure out who has the ability. You got to look at, at, at your talent, at, at, at your talent and your passion. Who's got the ability? Who? wants to do this, who can do this, and then make it so that person can, which is why I'm a big, I have great disagreement with the equal, you know, the equal inheritance thing where it's an undivided equal interest. All of us know plenty of families where one child stayed home with dad and mom, took care of them, took care of the farm, and then they die, and suddenly this child with undivided, unequal inheritance suddenly has to pay half a million dollars or a million dollars to buy out the interest of the siblings. The equity is not in stocks and bonds or treasury bills. It's in it's in the land. Farmers put all their equity in the land. It's not in uh, not in liquidable liquidable you know assets. So then the farm gets sold because the sibling who stayed there and now that sibling who stayed there is in his fifties or her fifties. They go through a, a life crisis because this is what they love, this is all they know, but they can't, they can't hang on to it because the sibling wants their million dollars. This, to me, is the biggest problem or, or you know, anathema in farm country. Farmers have to understand this is not about love, it's about stewardship. Who can steward that? 
next, if you've got two children, one stayed on the farm and the other one uh, went to town and they've got their 401K, Roth, medical insurance, and everything else, it's the height of unfairness to saddle the one who stayed home with having to buy out an equal share of the sibling who went to town and didn't hold it together. So that's a huge discussion that every family needs to have. And once you decide a plan, then you make it happen. Now, in Stockman Grass Farmer, we're actually trying to run a couple of succession articles per issue now because we really believe this is the elephant. This is tearing families apart. It's been doing it for some time. Most of us who are in farm country can recite several horrible stories of succession not done well, and we would like to see it done well. And there are ways to do it. You can sell the farm early. You can do gift programs. You can give cash to one and land to the other. I mean, in our family, for example, uh, there were three of us. I loved the farm. My other two siblings didn't. And I demonstrate an ability to keep it together, and so so I get the land, and they get everything else. Now, is the land worth more? Yep, the land is worth more. It's not equal, but you know what? The land is only worth a penny if I sell it. So if if I don't sell it, the land is worth. They're actually getting way more than I am because they're getting they're getting cash and cars and you know uh, all the stuff you can turn into cash. I'm getting something. I got to keep the barn roof on, the fences up, and the place painted and the you know the multiflora rose out of the fields you got to have these conversations you've got to figure out what your plan is going to be now that being said what about the young generation what about the, the the young people all right the young people have to understand that you're not owed anything and you have to show an ability to be a steward which means you have to do what demonstrates that you can hold it together and you got to remember, the farm isn't there after 40, 50, 100 years because somebody sat around and said they deserve it. They work for it. And so you have to prove that you can handle money, you can handle your time, and you can make decisions that warrant you getting, quote, unquote, special treatment to be the hat they hang their legacy on. Don't ask for special treatment. Don't ask for better living conditions. Don't ask for a better truck to drive. Show yourself faithful, and you will then garner the honor and respect of the older generation who's willing then to invest in you as the, as the heir apparent. These are the conversations that farm families have to have, but they, by and large, fear them and would like them to just go away but they don't go away and one day dad doesn't wake up mom doesn't wake up and then where are you you have to think about what's going to happen down sometimes the best thing is just to sell it and that's that's fine i mean my dad again i i you know, he was an accountant and, and i remember him telling these older farmers who had kids that didn't want it and were not that interested in it as these older farmers hit 60 and 70, he'd tell them, sell it now. Why work yourself to death till you're 80 on something that your family doesn't want? Just go ahead and sell it now, and you can get a little five-acre place, enough to have a garden and plant some trees and get your little farm fix, milk a cow if you want to. This is a long time ago, but you, know, you, you can get your farm fix on a few acres and enjoy your equity. Why should you die on your tractor so your kids can run off to Las Vegas with your money. You make these decisions early, not after the fact. You start this process early on. Joel, thank you for that. And I would also highly recommend Joel's book on this topic, Fields of Farmers, and subscribe to The Stockman Grass Farmer for this reason, if for no other, just to get this information and to learn more about these activities. Joel, I want to be considerate of your time. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and your thoughts with our audience. And I look forward to having more discussions with you in the future. Thank you, John. It's been an honor and a delight and uh, blessings on you. Thank you, Joel. 
The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.